Alex Hansry here. It is December 28, 2016. And in this series of podcasts, you may notice that I'm just strictly focusing on the topic, not so much the visual, and it allows me to get a lot more information in a short amount of time. And so this video, this podcast is going to be entitled Some of the Most Important Off-Grid Advice. And this may be advice for those living off-grid, uh, that are already off-grid or planning to go off-grid. And so I'm going to cover several different topics, one of which is land use codes. The next major topic is a uh, relationship with neighbors. I'm also going to address uh, making mindful use of technology to find ways to work from home if need be, if you're in a remote location. And um, of course, discussing um, trial runs, going out and being off grid for a prolonged period of time, several weeks to several months, and knowing how long you can basically survive with basic essentials. So those are basically four categories of conversation. It's really a much bigger conversation, but you know, to speak without notes, off the top of my head, four subjects. So beginning with land use codes, you can look at my entire Costia County playlist series and it sums up that whole mess. I went back to a county after they changed their land use code. Before putting down the money on land, I found out they were kicking people off their land. And so I YouTubed it and I have no investments in Costia County because I was informed of what was going on. And it also became very clear to me that a lot of people there really didn't appreciate my coverage, not only in the county, but some of the residents that preferred Costilla County really not be on the map at all. So it's important if you're thinking about investing in a certain area that you know what their current situation is, and you should always seek to get some sort of a contact with a the local. There's different ways you can do this. Facebook groups have really taken off. And even though it's, it's um, you know, uh, a way that government can surveil us all, it's also a way that you can find a group that's centered around a topic, a person, place, or a thing, <laughs> maybe a fan page. It's not just about fan pages, you know, or how many thousands of people like the president or the previous president. <laughs> but uh, you can find groups that are geographic. And you can ask people in those groups, uh, for some basic information. You should also know that a lot of these people don't want new people coming in, so you may not get accurate bits of information. But of course, the main issue is septic tanks and whether or not you're in a county or a community to where living on your own land is going to be an issue uh, unless you get a official septic tank. That's recommended by most counties, state and federal regulations, and uh, estimates are upwards to $30,000 for a septic tank. And a lot of our ancestors didn't come from a world <clears throat> where these types of regulations uh, were upheld, nor was it the cost that it is today to be in line with regulation. And so we do live in a climate to where land use codes are a contributing factor to homelessness, and it would be great if there was a coalition for people to put their minds together, if you will. People that have chosen to go off grid and found themselves made homeless because they picked a county that was cracking down on their land use codes. And I speak from experience when I tell you that when we went through our thing last year with Costilla County and I got online and I looked and I got the story out there to the world, I found out much to my dismay that it didn't matter how many um, outlets covered the story. There was no legal help. We literally had our um, moment of need, if you will, for legal assistance and private property owners in Colorado did not have their own ACLU, if you will, nor a united community. Uh, we, we were for a few days there were aspects of uh, the community and those staying in Costilla County and those with land went down to the meetings. And it was short-lived, and we went into winter. We went into winter, and um, it gets very cold in that part of North America, <laughs> in that part of Colorado. 
And so it's hard to talk about, but the, the community was not able to push forward because it was not strong. And so the land use codes were not pushed back, even though we got the story out. No matter how many people said, uh, code is not law. No one was able to show an example of how it's not law and how what they're doing was actually illegal. Not one single lawyer. And so it's very important to take into account that you may have your, uh, your beliefs as to what is the law and what is not the law. And you may firmly believe that if something is not the law, that someone will intervene on your behalf. The question is, is that the case? Or was that the case in Costilla County? And we see when they evicted Daryl Carter. Google the article, Happy Thanksgiving, Costilla County evicts disabled man, disabled veteran. Um, there was no real public support for Daryl Carter at the time that I interviewed him about his eviction on this channel. People were concerned, but no one knew what to do. So because of what I've already demonstrated and investigated, you can put it out there and the pain will be televised. The intervention, the legal intervention may not happen regardless of how many thousands see the video. So we learn from our mistakes. And so the first order of business when it comes to investing in a county is knowing what the land use code situation is. Has there been any changes? And how are people living there now? And are there um, rumors of changes to land use code coming? Uh, the next major area of advice is to not let your loneliness while living off the grid get you involved with the wrong people in the neighborhood. And I know what it's like to be really open and want to have a lot of friends or have any friends at all and want to help other people and then to be burned by those very people. But I even remember in Costilla County and other places offering free labor too, just in order for me to learn how to work with my hands or build and also my eagerness to want to work with others. Uh, you know, that we're showing some form of, okay, Alex, let's go and do this, only to see their nasty side come out or their abusive side come out. And, you know, th these would be different different individuals or different males, you know, that at one point or another I uh, uh, allowed into my life for the potential for friendship, uh, only to see uh, s some interesting personality attributes. And so to really go it your own way, is a lot safer when you're dealing with an off-grid situation and you're dealing with drama with people that live nearby it, it seems more um, more annoying than saying the city because it's quiet and I do believe that we as human beings are connected to each other so if there's like some resentment or anger going back and forth between yourself and someone in the neighborhood it's not good energy and if it does pop up try to diffuse it you know, I'm not going to go super new agey on you here. Try to diffuse it. Trust me. Uh, what my <laughs> major experience was in Costilla was hearing about uh, the feuding between the neighbors and how deep it went. The bad blood. And then drawing conclusions going, okay, people having a lot of time on their hands, not being spiritually centered, and not having enough positive things in their life in that area to focus their attention on. So the negative things compounded, it's because of the magnetics there. And you can just say off grid in general, it just stronger energy, stronger nature energies. Especially when you have a bunch of cell towers and a bunch of this, you know, it's almost like we're, we're more sensitive. We're tapped into the trees, but if there's anger going around back and forth, tell you what brothers and sisters, ain't gonna be all positive vibes. Ain't gonna be all kumbaya. You're gonna, you're gonna feel some war spirits. I'm going to sum this up right now. So you want to have peace inside your temple, inside your body, inside, you know, but you also want to have peace with your neighbors. So if you know that you're, it could be as simple as nothing personal, but the day and age in which we live in, 
There could be a higher than normal um, percentage of the population acting like they're suffering from cognitive impairment. Some say these are the days and and <laughs> periods uh, in our in our lifetimes in which we're seeing major uh, malfunction. What is your malfunction? I, I'd say that we're seeing some malfunction uh, and a lot of choices politically, socially. Um, a, a lot of things that people are watching and, and things of that nature, we're seeing a lot of malfunction in the mass consciousness. So out of self-preservation, um, we may choose to pull back during certain periods to protect ourselves when more and more people are showing uh, behavioral disorders of some form. This is totally healthy. This is totally normal. And I would advocate more of the independent go your own path as opposed to letting loneliness and a need for something. What is it? It could be something as simple as a bag of pot. You don't even want to be dependent on any neighbors for things such as that or anything dealing with substance, even if there is a therapeutic side. Becoming dependent or developing codependent relationships with with people in certain situations can be a detrimental thing. And so you want to work to become as independent as possible. And um, it could be a blessing when, for example, you're able to access certain resources or friendships or uh, alliances with people outside your community or in town. Uh, if you're off grid and you have some connection to the people in town, or a job so we've covered two of the four main suggestions and um, okay so one of them related to knowing what you need and the only way you're really gonna know what you need when it comes to um, to going off-grid is to live for a prolonged period of time without going to town and you can even set up certain situations to where, yes, you know, there, there's some sort of a, a fail safe. You know, you may not have all the food that you want, but, you know, in my situation, I have all the quinoa I want. And I have some powdered eggs, which, no, honestly, that, that's not a, uh, appetizing. Uh, but I am going a prolonged period of time without, you know, just having everything that I want. I'm actually on much more of a limited food budget and because you know there's only so much money coming in and I'm living a, a minimalist lifestyle uh, the amount of things are limited and I'm adjusting to a diet with less meat which costs more money and I'm eating more things that are less expensive including still cut oats with uh, peanut butter and uh, maple syrup which I'll be eating in a few hours I'm not a big fan of Top Ramen. There's a few packages of that. But our body literally can survive on less food. People can even take their uh, studies even deeper, meditation and eating the sun, if you will, sun gazing. But we're not going that far. But let's just say I would be in a situation where I couldn't get to town for three months. Could I ration out the food that I have? I didn't even mention the, uh, yeah, I have eight more boxes of pancake mix. <laughs> and I also have a, a package of flour. And also uh, wheat, which hasn't yet been cracked. And that could be turned to flour or bread. I also have, you know, something that could be put over an oven called a Coleman stove. And uh, that's how I would actually bake the bread, for those curious. So various things that I've been collecting over a period of time, practicing the baking of bread, something very basic, something that is in much of our DNA and ancestry. Uh, as well as building fires in the summer, not so much in the winter, uh, knowing how much propane I can live off of and, uh, you know, for a, for a given period of time in the winter. And having enough technology or the technological tools to access the outside world when I need to get back into town for supplies. I have utilized technology, and I've also seen technology fail. You know, so I'm being educated that certain backups I need more of, certain things I cannot afford to go without, certain things I'm going to have to just spend 40 or 50 on to have it as a backup for a emergency. And so I'm aware of what some of those things are. 
I also could probably use um, another computer, for example, and things of that nature. And so when I can afford certain things and upgrade certain things, I will do so. But I also be in a situation to where, you know, my water's freezing. Um, you know, there's also a fair amount of snow that has been melted down. My coffee for this morning came from melted snow. So I'm already in the phase of using the resources around me in some way, shape, or form. And I believe the, the last main conversation was additional income. Okay, so we've covered three out of four categories. Additional income through non-traditional means. So, you know, this is, this is a deeper conversation than just YouTube. But I discussed the, the possibilities with YouTube in a previous video. I don't think that YouTube is dead. And I do think that YouTube, as a way to generate money for yourself, as I am for myself, uh, that, that um, the golden years are not behind us. Just because some videos are being demonetized does not mean it's the end of YouTube. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult period that we're going through, but there have been many predictions about the end of the Internet that have not come to fruition. And by thinking such negative things about your own future, if that's not actually in the destiny for the country, all you're doing to yourself is hurting yourself by telling yourself you can't do it. And I've come to realize that there are, I, I have not really met any others except one involved in generating income from the internet while living off the grid. Most of the people that I have met either had no money or were on some form of SSI or welfare or growing marijuana. I have never met another webmaster that lived off the grid, for example. Uh, there's there, there may have been a few, actually. Uh, none that I've met that are actually generating an income. What I actually have come across is a little bit of anger, maybe even jealousy, and, and a little bit of lack of acknowledgement of some of the success that I have had, despite all the insults that have been thrown at me for living a non-conventional lifestyle and working for myself and, and generating income from donations, being the smaller of the three, followed by working for someone else's website, followed by the YouTube AdSense. So for a while, I was pulling in about $1,000 per month. Right now, there's potential for some of that to be changing. One uh, means of income may be going away, and I may have to work harder on my YouTube channel to make up for that um, shortfall as donations have flatlined or plummeted. And so there's certain periods and times where the energy is just not moving in that particular direction for whatever reason. So we have to compensate in some other way, shape, or form. So it is unnerving at times when you feel that it's all in danger. Uh, it's also important to be grateful for the things that we have and to see when we are on the up, on the uptick. Instead of the plummet, some people are suffering on YouTube more than others and they're seeing some of the uh, the subject matter that they are uh, choosing to cover uh, they're finding it under attack others that are not necessarily batting from their particular position in the alternative media uh, they are not facing the same level of demonetization and like I said what I've noticed is that certain videos I want to bring this more back on to making money online Certain videos using certain keywords have been flagged for demonetization. Um, anyways, so despite that, there's still hope for making money doing what you do on YouTube. And there's a lot of off-gridders that have turned to YouTube, that have done travel videos, and the ones that are the most successful are not ones like mine. <laughs> That's why I say, do as I say and learn from my mistakes. It's not really my mistakes, I'm just being myself. But if you be yourself, you're going to alienate certain subscribers. But there are certain off-grid channels that have marketed themselves as all off-grid all the time. Okay, so they're showing you the RV, they're showing you the batteries, and as simple as it is, they're staying on point with the journey of their homestead. And people are subscribing and people are liking, and as long as they don't buck the system and, and be like Alex Ansari, <laughs> you know, I could have 100,000 subscribers, but you see, I don't get on, on board. Uh, the consensus reality with regards to who somebody loves or doesn't like with regards to the establishment, as I generally don't like any of them. Uh, so because I'm not going back and forth, 
I'm a channel that is a lot of things at once, and that's a lot to accept to my audience. But what I'm saying to you is, for those of you also into journaling about your story, or writing an ebook about living off the grid, or even s people selling their blueprints, their tiny house blueprints, there are people, oh God, I can't believe some people are selling, are you selling me that, really? Where's the fucking blueprint? That aside, <laughs> John, my friend John Burroughs, forwarded me something like, you bought this? Oh my, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't have to say this, but you got fucked. Um, hey, if you're going to sell a blueprint, sell a freaking blueprint and show them how you did it. It's not just showing people like how good the picture looks. But if you have good content and you're able to sell it, regardless of the product inside, you can work for yourself. Now, other ways of making a living that I don't know anything about, but others pursue. Some people get into making websites where they advertise affiliate marketing, or they try to sell certain products to where visitors to that site that read that article may have an interest in a certain product. So the person that's educating them, and it could be health-based, is actually guiding them to another industry to where they're actually making a cut on the commissions and some women are very good at this that know their essential oils that are very organized and focused and independently minded and driven uh, some of them have proven to be very good at providing an income for themselves while living on the road so what I'm saying is you live in the day and age of the free Wi-Fi of the Starbucks like the company or not <laughs> of the coffee shop okay with the Wi-Fi whether you're into YouTube, affiliate marketing, uh, maybe you have an interest in real estate. Um, I mean, who knows? There may be a way that you can make money on the internet through the sharing of information or by being a, a middleman or middlewoman for a particular sale once you find a way to generate sales at your business. So we have access to technology in the modern day and age that off-gridders in the past never had. And we can learn from our, from our own mistakes. So we covered four areas in this podcast. Okay, Class, <laughs> what were our main points from land use codes? Part one. Anybody? Anybody? Give me three points. Three points. Give me three points from land use codes. Okay, we've got... Call and check and see what's going down before you put money in, okay? Uh, try to talk to a local and find out what's going on first. You know, try to find out if they're going to have issues in the future. Try to find out if septic tank issue, not having one, is going to be an issue. If you can't afford it, don't put money in that county, okay? Talked about neighbors, okay? Some people are off-grid because they really can't handle life in the grid. Don't let your loneliness entangle you with with bad friendships or relationships um, and you can even say especially if it's over pot access or things of that nature you don't want to begin a dependent relationship uh, with anyone who's a loose cannon okay um, we talked about um, knowing what you need to be on your own for a prolonged period in time and to place emphasis on how you do that I don't think I went into it enough. Put yourself in a situation where you go camping for a prolonged period of time and you adapt to that situation to where you have less. So while some people may shake their head at me being technically stuck in a snowstorm, I have all the fuel that I need. Uh, I'm going to have an internet repair soon. So I'm actually doing pretty well compared to how most people live in, say, a 10 by 12 shed. Uh, you know, using a propane heater only and uh, having a, um, a, a food supply which doesn't currently have a whole lot of uh, calories, fat, or animal product. It's, it's very minimal. A reality where I'm already uh, melting the snow for the coffee that I'm drinking uh, right now. So uh, I'm already in that um, phase and also realizing how much my solar, how effective it is throughout the winter at this elevation, how effective my batteries are, and how well my equipment is able to handle this temperature, in which most of it has actually survived while the internet modem battery pack absolutely uh, took a dive. 
leading me to think more about plastic baggies and things like that around electronics and certain things that could be sensitive to moisture and the inner circuitry frying. So I'm glad I added that. Going to our last point, of course, with the final point being investigating a way to make some form of income utilizing access to the internet. And whatever way that is, is, is up to you. I'm here to let you know that if I can do it, and I'm not even giving it 100%, I feel and I know that some of you can do it, and in some cases do it even better. And so if we have access to the technology, instead of you know, predicting doomsday after doomsday, we should use the technology to the best of our ability and be grateful that we have access to it. So those are my four major tips for going off-grid.